Hey everybody. So, the world we live in is a pretty strange place, honestly. It's loaded with traces of the bizarre, the macabre, the unusual, and the downright fascinating. You just gotta know where to look. Over the past... Uh year or so, I've taken short looks at a few selections from some of the most interesting stories and events the world has to offer, from lumberjack folklore and paleontology warfare to late night TV and sound circuits. We've gotten 10 or so small glimpses into the unexpected and interconnected web of intrigue that lies just beneath the surface of our day-to-day -day lives. In other words, the first season of mini episodes has officially come to an end. Now, season two will be starting up sometime in the new year, but before that I'll be taking one last foray back through each step along the way, with some small adjustments and bonus features submitted by viewers like you. So without further ado, I give you Tales from Our Bizarre World. Hey everybody. So picture this. It's the late 1800s and you're a lumberjack in the deep forests of the northeastern United States. After returning to camp for the night, you gather with others around the fire to eat dinner and trade stories. As the sky grows darker and stars begin to wheel overhead, the men begin to tell strange tales of the things which lurk in the lumberwoods. Bizarre and frightening creatures like nothing anyone has ever seen, with impossible traits and characteristics. You want to dismiss it as pure fiction, the twisted works of an idle mind, but you can't help but look about at the darkened trees that surround you, as if hoping to catch a glimpse of something that might be hiding between the leaves. These were, as we call them now, fearsome critters. North American folklore and mythology is an essential part of the historical culture that makes up the fabric of modern North American life. Early stories, characters, and legends were born from the melting pot of countless diverse cultures that migrated to the continent in the 18th and 19th centuries, along with the ones that had resided there for thousands of years prior. Throughout the 1800s and into a fair bit of the 1900s, isolated groups of individuals in the still vast and unexploited North American wilderness began to develop stories and mythos of their own, for a number of reasons a way to pass the time, an explanation for strange events, a unique method of enforcing norms and proper behaviors. Notable among these groups were lumberjacks, fiercely independent loggers and woodcutters who sought their fortunes and their freedom cutting and transporting trees from the thousands of miles of forested slopes across the continent. For the reasons mentioned previously, lumberjacks and other workers in the area formulated some of the most unusual legends and lore seen in these days, likely due to their isolated nature. Chief among these were the Fearsome Critters. A fearsome critter is a fictional, at least to our knowledge, creature said to live in the North American wilderness which possesses strange characteristics, making it wholly unique from any ordinary beasts one might encounter. Stories of these animals were told from person to person in and around logging camps for close to a century and were passed primarily through word of mouth. And since I've got nothing better to do, why don't we take a look at a few.
Now, an interesting trait of the fearsome critter is that very often it wasn't reported to be dangerous or fearsome, despite what the name might suggest. In reality, they were often more benign in nature, just strange little entities that serve to explain uncertain events or boost the credibility of tall tales. The Axe Handle Hound of Minnesota was a dog-like creature reported to swallow axe handles that were left unattended. The Tree Squeak was a small beast resembling a weasel, which, although very rarely seen, would hide in trees and emit unusual sounds, ranging from a shrill squeak to a pig-like squeal or even a loud gunshot. The temperament of the Tree Squeak was said to be quite fair. The Sidehill Gouger, known by an assortment of other colorful names, was a mammal with one short pair of legs and one long, said to use this evolution to navigate steep hillsides, creating ridges on hills. The mythos surrounding this particular creature is surprisingly deep. If a gouger fell off a hill, or by chance found itself on level terrain, the creature would move in helpless circles, unable to climb to a height once again. Some rare gougers were born with their short legs on the opposite side, making them round hills in the opposite direction. Such variants were said to be shunned by normal-footed gougers. Particularly notable among this category of critters was the legendary Hoogag, a massive, bizarre-looking animal reminiscent of a moose, which seemed to have its work cut out for it. Residing in the northern states and ranging into Canada, the Hoogag had no joints in its legs, rendering it unable to sit or even lay down. Additionally, its massive lip prevented it from grazing like a normal herbivore. As a result, the Hoogag was forced to take its rest by leaning on the trunks of trees, from which it would also strip bark for nutrients. The Hoogag was reported to travel across the huge distances of the countryside, serving as an explanation for two types of unnatural forest phenomena, trees with their bark inexplicably missing, and trees found to be at an unusual angle. The Hoogag was considered a fine trophy for experienced hunters, who over time learned to notch trees in order to weaken them, causing Hoogags who leaned upon the trees to fall and land helplessly on the ground. But not all fearsome critters were harmless. Many served as dire warnings to lumberjacks of the very real dangers presented by work in the unexploited lumberwoods. The hide behind, as one might expect, was an enigmatic creature known to hide while stalking its prey. Described as being tall, thin, and covered in black fur, the hide behind was vicious and deadly, subsisting off the intestines of its hapless victims whom it sprang upon while they traversed the woods. However, the creature's most dangerous trait was its stealth, as the hide behind was supposedly so adept at concealing itself behind objects or behind the observer that it was almost never actually seen until it was too late. The entity despised the scent of alcohol, however, so travelers were advised to drink before entering infested territory. The hoop snake may not have seemed particularly threatening on its own, but once it had grasped its tail in its mouth and curled into a hoop shape, it was reported to travel at upwards of 60 miles an hour. The creature's venom was toxic enough to kill another fearsome critter, the legendary hodag, in minute proportions. The hodag itself was one of the most infamous fearsome critters, said to be born from the remains of an ox. Massive, dangerous, and filled with malice. A number of tall tales chronicled the misadventures of those who attempted to combat the hodag. The Splinter Cat, one among a range of cat-like creatures, was known to launch itself at trees in search of bees and raccoons, its natural prey. The creature's hard skull and great speed allowed it to shatter a great number of trees, something very often attributed to windstorms. But even more plentiful among the ranks of these peculiar animals were those that served no real purpose, simply used as tools with which to relay tall tales. California's Funeral Mountain was noted to house the aptly named Funeral Mountain Terra Shots, peaceful coffin-shaped quadrupeds that, for an unknown reason at some point in their lives, have a compulsion to travel down the mountainside and traverse the searing desert. Unfortunately, as soon as the terror shots made contact with the sand, they would suddenly and unceremoniously explode, therefore being unable to complete their journey. The fur-bearing trout is exactly what it sounds like, a run-of-the-mill river trout covered in smooth fur. The Totorode shagmaw, found solely in Maine, had a pair of bear paws on its forelegs and moose hooves on its rear ones. It would alternate which pair it walked on in an effort to confuse trackers. 
The cactus cat of the southern states slashed open cactuses with bony protrusions on its forearms and waited for the cactus juice to ferment before getting trashed off its homemade mezcal. I'm not kidding by the way, that's, that's actually what it supposedly did. The Wapaloozy, native to the Pacific coast, dedicated its life to climbing up tall trees, something it was quite adept at. So possessed was the Wapaloozy by this urge to climb that, even after being killed, skinned, and fashioned into mittens, the mittens still attempted to climb up any stick they came into contact with. Perhaps one of the strangest, and certainly the most pathetic of all fearsome creatures, was the Pennsylvania Squonk. A misshapen, pig-like creature with sagging skin and bulging eyes, the squonk was said to frequently hide itself away and constantly weep over its unfortunate appearance. The creature thus leaves behind a path of tears, making the tracking of the squonk an easy task. However, this proves to be futile. If captured, the squonk slowly begins to dissolve into tears, making it impossible to truly catch. And these are just a few of the countless fearsome critters that work their way into the strange folklore of 19th century North America, and there are likely many more that have since been forgotten. The role of the fearsome critter in storytelling is quite a lot like that of other mythological creatures. Dragons, unicorns, manticores, and so on. Whether to teach lessons, impart warnings, explain phenomena, or simply to tell a mean story, these creatures are nevertheless a fascinating relic of a bygone era, and it's quite interesting just how many of them have managed to be remembered to this day. And as long as we continue to remember them, the fearsome critters of the Lumberwoods will likely continue to live on in their own unique way. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, so the last time we were here I talked to you guys about fearsome critters, strange otherworldly beasts that made up the substance of 19th and 20th century lumberjack folklore. But these creatures weren't the only subjects of North American tall tales. Lumberjacks were known to have created other mythical figures, most notable among these being a legendary woodsman named Paul Bunyan. Bunyan's legend wasn't always as fantastical as we see it now. He was originally said to be 8 feet tall and exceedingly skilled at felling trees, before being blown into the larger-than-life figure seen in films and literature today. One such example of these was created in 1958, an animated musical developed by the Walt Disney Company, an animation and overall entertainment company that was seeing great success in the early 60s. The company would continue to prosper throughout the century, even after the death of its founder, and alongside it, the medium of animation continued to remain at the forefront of worldwide culture. As we drifted into the 70s and 80s, one could see countless entrepreneurs and startup companies being formed, with the goal of one day rivaling the animation giants of the time. And, as the 90s finally rolled around, one such startup struck out with the intention of merging the time-honored animation tradition with the rapidly developing and infinitely diverse field of video game development. And while this company may not have thrived in the way it intended, its legacy has indeed lived on in quite an unusual way. Let's take a look at the rise and fall of animation magic. Now, if you've been on the internet for any reasonable amount of time, you've probably seen something like this. Or this. Or, if you're lucky, this. And if it's stuck with you, you're not alone. This incredibly distinctive style, rough 90s era edges, jerky over-exaggerated movements, bizarre and uncanny voice acting, is something that's been striking chords with internet users for over a decade and a half. And despite all the changes the internet goes through, they won't die out. These timeless animations always seem to find their way back into the internet's public consciousness. And these animations all have one major thing in common. They were all produced by the Russo-American game development firm Animation Magic in the last decade of the 20th century. But to understand how they got here, we first need to understand how they started. A man named Dale Disharoon was born May 13th of 1953 in the United States, and he would spend most of his childhood and early adulthood in the state of California. 
1981, Desharoon was working as a teacher, a position he had assumed soon after leaving college. The school's principal, seeing the recent personal computer boom in the US, had expressed interest in getting computers for the school, something Disharoon initially opposed. Once a series of Atari computers had been installed, however, Disharoon became fascinated by the potential personal computers had for the future of media. Throughout the early 80s, he experimented with writing his own programs in these early computer systems, at one point winning thousands of dollars in computer gear from a quarterly Atari programming competition. Disharoon would soon leave the education industry and work a few odd jobs, all involving the computer systems he had become invested in, and by the mid-80s he had started his own company, a small independent software production house called Dale Disharoon Incorporated, where he would work on a number of programs for the Apple II, Commodore 64, and other contemporary systems. But his involvement with animation magic wouldn't truly begin until 1987. That year, Disharoon would move to Boston to work for Spinnaker Software, a company that had been trailblazing the low-cost edutainment game market for years. And at the time of his joining, the company was just beginning work on a new, yet to be released, yet supposedly revolutionary technology that Disharoon would soon come to know very well. The system was the CDI. Designed by tech conglomerate Philips, the CDI was a new format of CD that allowed substantial multimedia storage space and the potential for interactive components. It was designed to work with Philips' own CDI consoles and aimed to combine elements of contemporary CD players with the game systems becoming more and more common. And, as Disharoon began to work for Spinnaker, the game company was being tasked with creating seven games to be available on the launch of the CDI. In 1989, Philips remarkably managed to secure a deal with up-and-coming game studio Nintendo, licensing Philips to create Nintendo-branded games to further entice the public into purchasing the CDI console upon release. But this was short-lived. The CDI's development cycle lasted far longer than was intended, and by the time of its release the CDI console was running on heavily outmoded hardware. Nintendo pulled out of the contract in 1990, but not before making what was, at the time, a small concession to Philips. The company could use a limited number of Nintendo's recognizable characters in games for their console, and while it wasn't the full Nintendo partnership they were looking for, it was better than nothing. By the time the CDI finally went public in 1991 with these seven Spinnaker games and a number of others, Dale Disharoon felt his time with the company was over. He left that year, and with a number of other Spinnaker employees, founded a new game design group, which temporarily went by the same name as his previous one, Dale Disharoon Incorporated. And since the company had been formed from most of the same team that had made these surprisingly successful Spinnaker games, Dale Disharoon Incorporated was soon contacted by Philips to create a few more. Philips was looking to make use of the characters Nintendo had allowed them to use, specifically characters from the Legend of Zelda and Super Mario franchises, both very popular at the time. Disharoon accepted the task and set to work designing, but the group quickly ran into a problem. Dale Disharoon Incorporated, while abundant with computer programmers, was lacking in the animation department, something Philips had specifically wanted to showcase the full motion capabilities of their new console. In late 1991, Disharoon got in contact with a man named Igor Razbov, a mathematician and computer scientist from St. Petersburg, Russia. Razbov proposed going into business with Disharoon, using Russian animators in conjunction with the US-based designers and programmers to form a cohesive unit which could deliver the games Philips was expecting on their unusually low budget. Disharoon accepted, and with this, animation magic was formed. From around 1991 to 1993, Animation Magic worked to produce their first two games for Philips, a pair of adventure RPGs based around the Legend of Zelda series entitled Link The Faces of Evil and Zelda The Wand of Gamelon. The company brought a few of the Russian animators to the United States to begin their work, and after preliminary production had begun, sent them back to the Russian division of Animation Magic to begin training other animators as well. Disharoon and Razmov worked in tandem to coordinate the two halves of game development on opposite sides of the globe, and considering their minuscule budget, things were going remarkably well. But issues would soon begin to crop up. The animators had varying levels of skill, and were somewhat inconsistent in their styles, which proved a problem for maintaining a level of quality with the animation. This would lead to the notoriously uncanny visuals that the games would come to be known for. But further issues presented themselves with the CDI system itself. 
Production on the console had lasted three years longer than was intended, and Philips refused to update the original 1987 hardware for a new generation of consoles. Despite being praised for its graphical capabilities, the CDI quickly became known as a clunky, difficult to work piece of equipment. Its infrared controllers were notoriously unreliable, its core CD reading system was slow and made many of the intended features impossible, and the console suffered financially, not just because of its thousand dollar price tag, but because, despite its biggest sellers being games, the CDI was never marketed to be for games in the first place. Coupled with mismanagement in the upper levels of Philips and the abysmal levels of funding Animation Magic was given, it was clear the company had their work cut out for them. But they persisted, and on October 10th of 1993, the two Zelda games were released. Animation Magic had saved dramatically by essentially designing one game engine that would be used for both games, implementing nearly identical game mechanics but with different enemies, storylines, and cutscenes. Now, contrary to popular belief, the game was not panned on release, as it is now. Rather, it received a fairly lukewarm response, with critics praising its impressive visuals but remarking on its clunky gameplay and its general mediocrity as a game. But Animation Magic wasn't finished yet. Soon after completing Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon, Animation Magic began work on another Nintendo-based game, Hotel Mario, and gave it essentially the same treatment as the Zelda games a year earlier. Hotel Mario, in which the Mario Brothers are tasked with closing doors in King Koopa's hotels for some arcane reason, was released on October 5, 1994, to similar reception as their previous titles. The games weren't awful, they were just decidedly average, and when compared with Nintendo titles of the time, which had strived to maintain a massive standard of quality and had considerably larger budgets, the Animation Magic games simply couldn't hold up. Another major issue was the general lack of oversight regarding the thematics of the games themselves. Neither Philips nor Nintendo seemed to care much about the consistency or accuracy of the game's art, storylines, or characters, reportedly only asking to see small pieces of concept art before giving Animation Magic the go-ahead. What resulted from this were games that, while competent on their own, were wildly out of sync with the image Nintendo had been trying to cultivate, and as a result they were shunned by fans of their respective franchises. Animation Magic's three CDI Nintendo titles would fade into obscurity, at least for a while, after this point. But this wasn't the end for the studio, either. Animation Magic was soon acquired by Capital Multimedia, in December of 1994, and after their multiple year stint with Philips, decided to abandon the CDI for good. The CDI system itself would eventually go on to be known as one of the worst game consoles ever developed, and regrettably, it's often remembered for the low quality of the games Philip had contracted Animation Magic to produce. Following their departure from the CDI market, Animation Magic decided to move into the PC games scene. One of their first and most successful titles was the popular I Am Mean, released August 11th, 1995, an edutainment game for MS-DOS in which the player is tasked with defeating the magician Ignatius Mortimer Mean and freeing imprisoned children by way of learning proper spelling and grammar. Notably, I Am Mean contained animation very similar to that seen in Hotel Mario and the Zelda duology, and this visual style would go on to be a trademark of the group. While the game's educational components were largely panned, the game itself was considered quite remarkable, and it's remembered a lot more fondly today than Animation Magic's previous CDI projects. Throughout 1995 and 1996, Animation Magic continued to produce small-scale educational games for PC, including Darby the Dragon and the Magic Tales series. The company produced a spiritual successor to I Am Mean, Chill Manor, and a handful of other educational games around this time as well. In late 1996, the company was once again contracted, this time by Blizzard Entertainment, to create an adventure game based around the popular Warcraft franchise, entitled Warcraft Adventures, Lord of the Clans. But this project would soon fall through in 1997, and Animation Magic was again bought out, this time by Davidson and Associates, the then owners of Blizzard. By this point, Dale, who had since changed his last name to DeSharon, had essentially completed his run with Animation Magic. The Sharon moved to Kiev in 1997 and founded a new company, Boston Animation, to operate in a manner very similar to Animation Magic. Animation and Magic itself would again be sold in December 1998 to Vivendi, a media conglomerate, and following Vivendi's financial troubles around the turn of the millennium, Animation Magic was essentially shut down for good in 2001. 
It had lasted close to a decade, and, whether intentionally or not, had left behind an unforgettable legacy in the form of its strange but infinitely memorable games. The Sharon and Boston Animations continued to do art and animation for game studios throughout the 2000s, until Dale DeSharon became sick with leukemia in 2007. He died on February 5th of 2008, just a few years after giving an interview that illuminated much of the animation magic story for the world to see. Around this same time, DeSharon's decade-old works would begin to see new life. The rapidly developing YTP community took to the scenes from the Zelda games Hotel Mario and I Am Mean exceedingly well, and they continue, to this day, to be the most instantly recognizable icons of YTP the world has ever seen. Other elements from the game seem to permeate various corners of the web. The shopkeeper Morshu's dialogue from Faces of Evil, Mario's opening words from Hotel Mario, and much more all remain iconic even to this day. The legacy of Dale DeSharon and Animation Magic may not be a perfect one, but in its own unusual way, the company managed to bring joy to people all across the globe nearly 30 years after its creation. And in the end, that really is the best they could have hoped for. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, so in the last two episodes I talked about Animation Magic, a now defunct game development and animation firm that found moderate success in the 1990s. In the end, Animation Magic simply wasn't able to survive in the increasingly competitive gaming market of the early 2000s. People love trying to one-up each other and best others in competition, and this drives the gaming industry's competitive nature, alongside many other industries as well. But very often, the competitions people find themselves in can quickly boil over into all-out war. It seems like it's pretty much human nature to start conflicts over small things that usually aren't worth starting conflicts over. Console wars, format wars, cola wars, it's almost as if any time there's more than one person or group involved in some new and potentially profitable development, they're bound to start brawling with usually disastrous results. But what if I told you that in the field of paleontology, the art and science of digging up things that have been buried for several million years, there were two individuals so motivated by their desire to dig up more than each other that they would start a war of their own. In this KRB mini episode, by popular request, let's recount the strange tale of the Bone Wars. To understand the Bone Wars, it's important to point out that in the mid-19th century, scientifically driven paleontology in the United States was a relatively new and largely experimental field. Using the fossil record to establish a history of species was a bold and unexplored frontier, and there were many eager to capitalize on it. Two of the most active in this arena were a pair of scientists named Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. And these were two men who took their dinosaur bones very seriously. And yes, those were their actual names. The two had relatively disparate beginnings. March was born in 1831 to a poor New York farming family, but through financial assistance from a wealthy uncle, he eventually attended a number of universities and made a name for himself in the natural sciences. Cope was born in 1840 to a wealthy Pennsylvania Quaker family and soon found himself undertaking similar pursuits to Marsh. Their first meeting, interestingly enough, was amiable. Cope and Marsh met abroad in Germany, became acquaintances, and even named dinosaurs after each other, which, if you're a paleontologist, is probably pretty neat. Cope was even friendly enough to show Marsh around his proverbial secret fishing spot, a marl pit in New Jersey where he had been paying miners to send him samples of fossils if they were found. But it was at this point, in 1868, that two events would set the Bone Wars into motion. The first of these was an underhanded move by Marsh. Deciding to capitalize on the fossil site Cope had already discovered, Marsh simply paid the miners more than Cope had already been paying to send the fossils to him instead. Cope, upon finding out, was understandably quite pissed off. 
but a second slight against him would seal the deal. That same year, Cope had reconstructed the skeleton of an aquatic dinosaur he called Elasmosaurus, but Marsh was quick to point out that Cope had stuck the head onto the wrong end of the dinosaur entirely. Now, I do somewhat understand how that mistake could have been made, considering how funky this thing looks, but that didn't change the fact that Cope was even more outraged by this humiliation, and from this point onward, the two were bitter enemies. Each scientist decided the best way to prove their superiority was simply to find and document more fossils than the other, and they had chosen an excellent place and time as countless fossil deposits and bone beds were being discovered in the American West right around this period. Cope had been digging for quite a bit longer, and by 1872 he was heading an expedition by the US Geological Survey with government funding. Although Marsh preferred to stay back in the East, he sent countless expeditions of his own to the Western bone beds in the hope of slowing Cope's progress and finding fossils of his own. After discovering fossil evidence in Dakota Territory, Marsh attempted to broker a deal with Oglala leader Red Cloud, although he would soon back out on the agreement, taking the money, or in this case, the bones, and running. During this period, a number of renowned species were discovered and published in scientific journals, but to the two men this was only a side effect. All that mattered was who was the better paleontologist, or more accurately, who could find the most bones the quickest. As a result, the two were very often somewhat hasty with their classifications, Cope more so than Marsh, and they would often discover dinosaurs that had already been found, or falsely identify new species, like when Marsh put a new skull onto an apatosaurus body and called it a bronze. But by this point, Cope was still in the lead. Marsh, however, got a chance to take the advantage in 1877. Both scientists received a letter this year from an Arthur Lakes in Colorado, containing evidence of fossils in the area. Marsh's agents got there first, but were subject to fierce competition from Cope once they arrived. Soon, a pair of Union Pacific Railroad workers sent similar correspondence to Cope and Marsh, informing them of fossils in Como Bluff, Wyoming, again prompting fierce competition. This was the point at which the conflict devolved into all-out war. Both Cope and Marsh ordered their workers to steal from the other sites, destroy leftover fossils to prevent the competition from getting it themselves, and even sabotage the opposing digs in an effort to slow them down. Although these digs produced countless more fossils, including Stegosaurus, Apatosaurus, and Allosaurus, they were beginning to damage the paleontological community as a whole. Cope and Marsh's bone wars were beginning to make headlines, and it was becoming clear to the public they were motivated more by animosity rather than a scientific curiosity, but as always, Cope and Marsh pushed on. By the time the 1880s rolled around, Marsh had taken the lead. His contacts in Washington had allowed him to be the appointed head of the U.S. Geological Survey, and he continued to discover new fossils as Cope's funds were steadily running dry, due in part to the pair's constant efforts on the sidelines to ruin the other's credibility. Cope had even bought out an entire scientific journal in order to get his findings published more prominently in it. But Cope's final chance to ruin Marsh would come in 1884, as the Bone Wars were beginning to die out. An investigation into Marsh's doings as the head of the Geological Survey was beginning, giving Cope an opportunity to share his 20 years of collected evidence detailing Marsh's criminal activity, of which there was quite a lot. This attempt was actually quite successful, stripping Marsh of his title, his wealth, and most importantly, his fossils. But Cope wasn't exactly doing so hot either. His health had been failing for years, and his once remarkable wealth had been sucked dry by his decades of sabotage attempts. The same could be said for Marsh. Cope died in 1897 with barely a penny to his name, and Marsh died two years later with only slightly more in his bank account. In one final, desperate, beyond-the-grave attempt to prove his superiority, Cope had his head cut off after his death, hoping to compare his brain with that of Marsh to prove he was the smartest, but understandably, Marsh refused the offer, and with that, the two took the Bone Wars to their graves. Now, the wars weren't all that bad for paleontology. Between the two of them, Cope and Marsh discovered over a hundred new species, and essentially laid the bedrock of American paleontology pretty much single-handedly. Although their conflict might have been the end of them, it was a beginning for a whole new field of scientific discovery. And in the end, well, it's not like they would have cared that much about it, but at least it's something that we can be thankful for. Thanks for watching.
Hey everybody. So, last episode I told you guys about the Bone Wars, a bizarre 30 year conflict between two very competitive paleontologists to dig up more bones that eventually led both of them to their graves. In many ways the Bone Wars were a product of their time, made possible by the slow and unreliable transportation and communication of the 19th century. It's unclear if something like that could have happened in the modern era with the advent of things like the internet. In fact, there's a lot of things born from the internet in just a few decades that pretty much no one could have predicted in the past. Notable among these is the idea of copy pasta. In case you've been living under a rock or a similar object for the past few years, copypasta is essentially the act of copy and pasting a usually large, usually humorous string of text in a variety of places across the internet for a variety of reasons. It's yet another one of those weird little internet concepts that we really just do take for granted, simply because it's been around for what is, in internet terms, a pretty long time. But something you might not know, nor expect, is the fact that in order for copypasta as we know it to truly truly be conceptualized and popularized on the World Wide Web, some pretty major technologies and prototypes of modern internet phenomena had to first blaze the trail. In this KRB mini episode, let's take a look at copypasta lore. Computers have been around for a long, long, long time. Probably a bit longer than many people realize. But a lot of the things we take for granted in our computer systems are relative newcomers to the computing scene. Some of the very first true computers, besides those used for mathematics and science, were used as word processors in business machines, with computer scientists attempting to automate many of the functions that were, at that point, still done entirely by hand. Bookkeeping, copying documents, sending mail, and so on were all considered at the time to be something pretty revolutionary for computer systems, as weird as it may seem now. Around the 60s and 70s, the go-to for a computer's public interface was a text-based system, where users punched in their commands and the computers did the work. What we consider computer graphics today didn't really exist at this point, and user-friendliness wasn't even on the table. But it's important to understand that in this era, computers were almost entirely relegated to use by scientific professionals, researchers, and colleges. Making something the average consumer would use wasn't really the goal, and even basic functions like editing text or copy and pasting were done in a strangely arcane fashion, usually involving a mode system in which a user would have to change a computer's mode in order to perform different operations with the same commands. But in the early 1970s, a man named Larry Tesler set out to change this. To put it bluntly, Larry Tesler hated modes. They were the standard at the time, but Tesler saw a future in which personal computers could be found in the homes of anyone imaginable, and he believed that modes, along with text-based interfaces as a whole, were just too impractical for this to become a reality. And so, in 1973, Tesla joined a team at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center to contribute work on the Xerox Alto, a personal computer that was, in many ways, an entire decade ahead of its time. The Alto was the first major computer system to feature a graphical user interface, where the user could actually see visual representations of the tasks they were performing, as opposed to just lines of text on a screen. Tesla contributed to the development of the Alto, most notably acting as the lead designer for a word processor called Gypsy. The program was, in many ways, as revolutionary as the Alto itself, being the first text editing program to make use of a GUI and a mouse. But of most interest to us is a certain feature implemented in the program around 1974. Tesla, along with another computer scientist named Timothy Mott, implemented a system through which a user could select text using the cursor, enter a command that stored the text data to a temporary memory location, and then place the text elsewhere with another command. This was the very first copy and paste, and from here, it could only go up. 1975 saw the release of Tesla and Mott's word processor. While GUIs were slow to catch on, what would become the single most essential copypasta tool was now out in the open. From a technical standpoint, we were already there. From a cultural standpoint, not so much. Like I said before, computer users at this time were a very specific and very specialized group of people that used computers almost entirely for work purposes. While copy and pasting existed, it's not like anyone was going to go around using it to slap paragraphs of text in places they didn't belong. 
No, to get there, we still have a bit of work to do. Now, if you look at it a certain way, Copypasta could very well have started with a single bizarre incident in the spring of 1978. A mainframe known as the DEX System 2020 had just been unveiled by the Digital Equipment Corporation, which apparently was something you could just name your company in 1978. Eager to advertise and demonstrate the new product, a marketeer named Gary Thurk decided to target potential customers by sending out a mass promotion over ARPANET, which for those who don't know was essentially an early computer network developed by DARPA. By hand, Thurk and another coworker punched in 400 ARPANET addresses from an address book and, at 12.33 Eastern Daylight Time on May 3rd, sent out an invitation for any message recipients to view a demonstration of the DEX System 2020. Now, this probably doesn't seem like a big deal, but you have to realize that at this point in time, there were estimated to be about 2,600 ARPANET users in the entire world. Thurk had just sent what was essentially the first instance of spam to about 15% of everyone online that year. In modern terms, that would be the equivalent of messaging about 525 million people all at once. So, now we'd established that text could not only be copy and pasted with computer systems, but also duplicated endlessly over computer networks for any number of purposes. But we still got a way to go. Copy and paste, along with GUIs, which were by necessity somewhat linked, became far more mainstream in the early 80s with systems like the Apple, Lisa, and other personal computers that employed both of them. And just as Tesla predicted, personal computers began to enter the homes of everyday individuals, meaning Thurk's accidental spam email wasn't likely to be a one-off event. As the 90s began to roll around, we saw the rise of BBS and Usenet forums, where computer users, now numbering in the tens of thousands, could gather, communicate, and most importantly, copy and paste. This was when the idea of spam began to be fully realized. The term itself is believed to have originated from a Monty Python bit, where the word spam is repeated incessantly. The practice of spamming became commonplace on these early boards and forums, and it was many users' first experience with the idea of copying, pasting, and sending random text over and over again, usually for the purpose of annoying someone. And alongside this, another more long-form style of spam was beginning to circulate as well. The mid-90s saw a significant uptick in chain emails. They would promise fame and fortune if circulated, or curses if left alone. One of the most famous among these were the infamous advance fee, or 419 scams, most notably the Nigerian Prince scam. And these emails all share the common trait of having long, often unintentionally humorous strings of text that one was expected to share. By the time the early 2000s rolled around, all of this was considered commonplace, and it's entirely likely that people were already beginning to adopt the beginnings of copypasta. But it wouldn't be until the mid-2000s that someone actually put a name to it. It's believed by many that the term copypasta itself emerged from the maelstrom of 4chan or another contemporary message board around the dark age of 2006. While its exact internet origins are unclear, its linguistic origins are not. Copy and paste became copy paste, and copy paste became copy pasta. Surprisingly simple. The terminology was solidified on April 20th of that year when someone posted the definition to the illustrious halls of Urban Dictionary, and the concept began to become more fleshed out. A natural evolution of chain emails, copy pasting, and some aspects of spam, copypasta in its modern form generally just consisted of a user finding some strange or humorous block of text that they decided to share in various places across the early internet. A number of early copypastas were single strings, usually some type of nonsensical rambling or inside joke that would be shared on message boards and social media sites and put into people's bios and signatures and so on. Early examples included mudkips and has anyone really been far even as decided to use even go want to do look more like, and as time wore on they began to grow more complex. Around 2007, a sort of splinter group was formed from the general idea of copypasta. Creepypasta was a derivation of the main idea in which the content of the copypasta was horror-themed as opposed to comedic. Before a centralized hub was formed for creepypasta, a number of shorter ones were spread through simple copy and pasting, as internet users decided to share the scary story someone sent them the other day on MySpace. The idea helped to further popularize copypasta as a whole. Around 2009, a subreddit was created to aggregate well-known copypastas, and this allowed thousands of copypastas to be accessed by anyone looking for something they could paste into the replies of a post they didn't like. Around 2010, we see the formation of even longer copypastas, like the legendary Navy SEAL rant, which I'm sure I don't even need to read out, and much, much more. 
Now, by this point, the idea was pretty much already there. Internet users had a wide variety of copy pastas to choose from. They could be unhinged rants from YouTube videos or monologues taken from films or, in many cases, paragraphs of text designed to make the user feel as revolted and miserable as possible. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So, as the months dragged into years and eventually into a decade, all we really did was add to the pile. There was a notable resurgence of copypasta type media in the mid to late 2010s, with a variety of text blocks like Burger King Foot Lettuce, Hot Chip and Lie, and a personal least favorite of mine, the script for a 2007 animated film starring Jerry Seinfeld. I swear to God, being online in 2017, you physically could not escape this thing. It was just everywhere. But that's besides the point. Nowadays, we accept copypasta as a well-established phenomenon that spans the entire World Wide Web. And love it or hate it, it's most likely here to stay. But it wasn't always this way. And who knows, maybe in 10 more years, it'll have turned into something completely different. Hell if I know, I'm just along for the ride. Thanks for watching. Hey, so this is a plug, uh, probably the second or maybe third I've ever done. If I could have a minute or two, I'd like to tell you real quick about one way you can support the channel and get cool stuff. If you're not interested in hearing that, I completely understand and I don't fault you at all. Uh, jump to the provided timestamp to get right back to the video, and thanks for watching regardless. Now, if you're still here, I appreciate it and I promise I won't take too long. Now, making videos has been, and likely always will be, something I just do. It's fun, I really enjoy doing it, and it's great to see you guys enjoy it too. For these reasons, I'm definitely not going to stop making videos anytime in the near future. But it can be a little difficult. For those of you who don't know, I'm currently attending college, and I'm regularly faced with having to balance school stuff, clubs, and standard activities like buying food and driving. This is all normal stuff, but then I add on to it the 15 or more hours I spend working on videos every week and it gets a little tricky. Making videos is great, and I couldn't ask for a better hobby, but it takes a very, very long time. Time people normally spend doing things like getting jobs or working internships, which make things like buying food a little easier. So, as a result, I made a Patreon. If for some reason you don't know what that is, essentially it's a service that allows viewers to support the channel with monthly donations and get cool stuff in return. I currently have three tiers, $1, $3, and $5, and I don't plan on going higher anytime in the near future, so honestly, any small amount will help. Depending on what tier you get, you can receive behind-the-scenes material, full video scripts before they're recorded, original music composed for videos, and even have your name featured at the ends of videos. Not only does this help me pay for living expenses, it can also help to improve videos themselves. Uh, my patrons now give almost enough for me to pay a motion array subscription to continue getting those cool stock videos I'm always using. And the next step after that is a newspaper archive payment so I can keep using news clippings. Now obviously you should not in any way feel obligated to do this. There's probably a million and one better ways to spend your money than paying random people on the internet. But if you feel so inclined, it would mean a lot to me if you chose to support the channel, and it would make doing things outside of video production just a little bit easier. But regardless of whether or not you do, I really appreciate if you guys have stuck around to listen, and with this, I'll stop bothering you and let you get back to the video. Hey everybody, so last episode we talked about the origins and development of copypasta, and while I'd like to tie that into this video's subject, it's been a while since I've done one of these, so let's just start off by setting the scene. If this scenario doesn't apply to you, then I'm sorry, I really don't know what to do about that. It's very late at night, or possibly very early in the morning, somewhere in the late 2000s or early 2010s. It's a school night, and your parents probably think you're asleep, but much to the contrary, you're wide awake. The TV, on low volume, is tuned to what was just a few hours ago, Cartoon Network. But CN's broadcast day has long since concluded. You've tuned in at this godforsaken hour to watch things you can't find anywhere else. Depending on the era, it could have been Futurama, Robot Chicken, The Boondocks, or if you were really lucky, Xavier Renegade Angel. You were tuned in to Adult Swim. But something happens that you didn't expect. In the darkness between the infomercials for mail-order products and the episodes of the shows themselves, strange little snippets of inexplicable media appear on screen then vanish just as quickly. They range from comedic to thought-provoking to bizarre and even frightening, and to your eyes late at night they seem to beam themselves directly into your consciousness, branded into your mind for you to suddenly remember ten years later. 
these were Adult Swim's iconic bumpers and sign-off messages. And to this day, they remain bizarre pieces of media that continued to amuse and astound viewers of the channel, just as they did two decades prior. And you know what? While we're on the topic, why don't we make that today's subject? On this KRB mini episode, as requested by a viewer, let's take a look at Adult Swim bumpers. In the early 1990s, Western animation was beginning to develop a wider appeal to adult audiences. Animation had long held a reputation for being geared towards children, spurred on largely in part by half a century of cartoons and animated films. But a number of pioneering projects during this era had shown networks that animated cinema could appeal just as strongly to adults as children. The channel Cartoon Network was, at the time, one of the fastest growing cartoon broadcasters in the world, and had largely taken up the mantle from its predecessor and parent corporation, Warner Bros., producers of the wildly successful Looney Tunes franchise. Of course, now Cartoon Network is actually owned by a division of a division of a company owned by Warner's parent corporation, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, throughout the 90s, the network was rapidly establishing itself, with a combination of its massive backlog of Warner Bros. classic cartoons and a string of well-received original series that allowed it to compete with other industry giants like Nickelodeon. And this rise to success coincided with some of the industry's first mainstream ventures into adult animated series. CN had experimented with airing slightly less child-oriented cartoons before this point, but then Vice President of Programming Mike Lazo was the first to suggest a programming block entirely devoted to original series, not geared towards kids. The first program designed to fit this mold was Lazo's own Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, an animated talk show starring repurposed Hanna-Barbera superhero characters from the 1960s. Throughout the rest of the late 90s and into the very early 2000s, CN released the pilots for several more shows in the same vein as Space Ghost, including Aqua Teen Hunger Force and Sea Lab 2021, but at this point they were simply classed as late-night special programming, with nothing to really tie them together. And so, after several months of delays, CN officially launched its newest programming block, Adult Swim, on September 2nd of 2001, with Lazo overseeing the development of several new shows. And from this point onward, the block continued to expand. In the very early 2000s, Adult Swim was working quickly to develop the fundamentals viewers would come to expect, arranging lineups of anime and original series, establishing a consistent late-night broadcast schedule, and, naturally, creating bumpers. For those who don't know, bumpers are a staple of modern radio and television that have existed for several decades. In essence, they're short video sequences that usually contain music, a voiceover, text, or video clips, and they play during the period between the actual shows on a channel and commercial breaks. Traditionally, the purpose of a bumper is to delineate the boundary between advertisements and programming, but in many cases they're used for anything from announcing upcoming shows, hinting at special events, or simply providing a channel ident. And that's about it. But Adult Swim, eager to break what was the mold for animation TV at the time, wanted to do things a little differently. From the beginning, the bumpers shown on Adult Swim were odd. The block's very first bumpers were loosely themed around its name. These early clips featured footage of seniors performing various pool-related activities, whilst an announcer informed viewers about upcoming shows. These were relatively basic and didn't stick around very long, as by the early to mid-2000s, Adult Swim was beginning to branch out and get a bit more creative with the bumps. Bumpers began to become more stylized or abstract, some featuring strange iconography or bizarre text, and it was also around this period that the iconic white-on-black message cards began to show up as well. The cards, which changed frequently, would appear to pose odd questions to viewers, make little statements, or at one point answer viewer questions. This style of bumper became a staple of the programming block, but Adult Swim was still interested in diversifying. The next few bumpers to appear were far less straightforward, with many featuring slightly disconcerting photos or videos accompanied by some pretty sick music. Others still were bizarre and just a bit unnerving, like the Adult Swim is your friend bumper, which featured a still frame of weathered posters saying the titular phrase to the tune of some truly unique musical choices. Already it was clear that the people behind Adult Swim were more than willing to make their bumpers bizarre, meaningless, or even a bit unnerving, and it wasn't like it was unclear why. The channel was pushing the boundaries of what was accepted in the field of animation television, and their brand had begun to center around this idea of doing things seldom done before. Off-kilter bumpers you couldn't find anywhere else definitely fit into the overall scheme of things, 
But this was just the beginning. By the time the mid-2000s rolled around, the programming block had expanded considerably, and so had its lineup of bumpers. A few show-specific ones had begun to make the rounds, and several more surrealist ones began to be shown circa 2005 in the style of old film reels. This era also heralded the appearance of more bumpers consisting of still frames, some of empty urban locations, and many of tilt-shift shots taken in cities. Many of the settings in these still frame bumpers would fall under the liminal spaces umbrella, and the non-photo bumpers contributed to this same overall strange and sometimes melancholy atmosphere. The overall theme being established, along with the late hours in which Adult Swim was broadcast, made many of these bumpers distinct and vivid memories for those who watch them, and it's likely this is one of the reasons they're so well remembered and well loved today. But this era also saw the introduction of what is likely Adult Swim's most infamous bumper, one that is remembered a little less fondly by some. The Dawn Is Your Enemy was a legendary sign-off bumper that began appearing in 2005. It featured an eerie grayscale graphic of a leering sun rising over a painted landscape, while a pair of realistic human eyes appeared over the horizon. The frame lasted in only a few seconds, and was accompanied by disturbing grinding and screeching sounds. Seeing this in the early morning hours was undoubtedly a shocking experience for a number of regular Adult Swim viewers, and for any children that may have been watching, well, it probably scared the hell out of them. Someone even made a creepypasta about it, which is pretty neat. The Dawn Is Your Enemy was one of a number of disturbing or disconcerting bumpers that began to roll out alongside these standard surreal ones throughout the late 2000s, and there's a few theories for why they existed in the first place. One of the most interesting is the idea that they were created to discourage children from tuning into the channel. While the block did feature a standard parental warning when it took over from Cartoon Network, it's difficult to deny that a terrifying bumper at 1 in the morning would probably be a lot more effective at scaring away kids. But this is obviously unconfirmed, and it's entirely likely that Adult Swim was simply continuing their time-honored tradition of seeing just how weird their bumpers could become. As 2010 came and went, the lineup continued to change. Adult Swim introduced several live-action bumpers, along with specially made animated ones and the time-honored standard of the classic message card. Many were one-off bits or gags, like this one in which many objects are stuffed inside a cornucopia for no discernible reason. Even further on, the network chose to partially transition towards more animated bumpers, some of which told short stories and some of which simply existed to promote the characters and locales of the shows featured in the block. The surreal and bizarre aesthetic remained, however, and although the network had begun serving a new generation, the bumpers remained as recognizable as they once were. And now, as many of the adults, and of course children, who watched that channel in the last 20 years have grown older, they continue to reminisce on the most iconic bumpers of the past. And when I say these bumpers are remembered very fondly, I'm not exaggerating, to the point that there existed a social media trend around a year ago in which users would attempt to create videos in a style similar to those broadcast by Adult Swim. Everyone seems to have a memory of one particular bump that stuck with them. For me, it's this one tilt-shift shot of an overpass that I remember seeing at my grandma's house circa 2010, somewhere between King of the Hill and something else. And if you think about it, that might just have been one of Adult Swim's greatest successes. They created a well-known, even legendary calling card from the simple industry standard of TV bumpers. They made it something you could only find on Adult Swim, and as a result they became ingrained in the minds of viewers forever to remind them of their memories watching the block, whether good or bad. And in the process of doing so, it became a shared cultural experience that, in its own way, serves to bring us all just a little closer together. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody. So, last episode I talked about Adult Swim and its legendary bumpers, bizarre little pieces of visual media that played between shows in the dead of night and bewildered all who watched them. Disregarding the bumpers themselves, the block itself has long been a safe haven for video creators to screen their projects to the greater TV watching audience, most notably with longtime Adult Swim collaborator David Hughes' early morning variety show, Off the Air. In 2018, Hughes launched a more focused online variant of the program entitled Adult Swim Smalls, designed to be used between programs on Adult Swim's site and showcased on their YouTube channel. Like Off the Air, Smalls features small films by lesser-known artists played with little to no context. They're often described as strange, experimental, or downright bizarre. 
One ongoing series on Smalls, if two episodes counts as ongoing, is Wally Winter, the unfortunate adventures of an inept child named Wally and his father who attempts to guide him throughout a frozen landscape. The off-kilter music, surreal art style, and disjointed vocals will likely be unfamiliar to most, but a few among you may recognize it as the works of Pilot Red Sun. Pilot Red Sun is an artist who's gone by a number of names, and in the modern internet landscape, he's very often known only peripherally, through a half-remembered video, a snippet of music, or a segment of a collab. But indeed, he has been around for a lot longer than even those who know him would think, and along the way he's lent inspiration to a great deal of aspiring creators, including, as you might have guessed, myself. So, in today's KRB mini episode, I'm going to be taking a look at Pilot Red Sun. Now, Pilot Red Sun is the most well-known alias of one Michael Epler, born in 1994 and currently residing in San Jose, California. Those of you who already know of his existence may have found him through a variety of sources, but those who are unaware or only peripherally aware probably know him from his YouTube channel under the Pilot Red Sun name, on which he released a number of animations that have seen quite a bit of traffic. But regardless of whether or not you're familiar with him, his story goes back a lot longer than many would think, and details one artist's journey to self-realization through the evolving art they created. As such, we'll start at the beginning. On January 16th of 2008, a YouTube channel entitled Pokey Remix Studio PRS, was created. For two to three years throughout the end of the 2000s, Pokey Remix Studio uploaded upwards of 70 videos featuring what you'd likely expect from the channel's name. Remixes of all shapes and sizes based off the music from the Pokemon series, ranging from techno remixes of area themes from Gold and Silver, to remixes of the original trainer battle theme from Pokemon Red and Blue, and many more in between. From the creation of the channel's oldest remix, technically composed in 2007 before the channel's creation, Pokey Remix Studio covered many of the themes from most of the games until the channel's upload schedule began to wind down circa 2011. And as you might expect, this was Pilot Red Sun's first venture into music production. He would later state that he was only 14 at the time of the channel's creation, and produced many of the remixes out of a love for the games and their music throughout high school, during which he regarded the channel as his, quote, pride and joy. And others seem to share this appreciation. Many of Pokey Remix Studio's more popular remixes received views in the hundreds of thousands or even millions, with the channel racking up over 39 million views throughout its existence. PRS would also occasionally post Pokemon-themed art pieces, hinting at an interest in digital art that would become more fully realized years later. Poke Remix Studio was, at the time, regarded as one of the foremost Pokemon Remix channels on the entire site, and in many ways it still is today. But as 2010 came and went, the artist who had yet to become Pilot Red Sun decided that the project had mostly run its course. He would upload a few more remixes sporadically over the coming years, but for the most part he was ready to move on to new endeavors. And so he did. Now, interestingly, Pokey Remix Studio is a chapter in the Pilot Red Sun story that few are aware of, and this actually works both ways. You see, the majority of Pokey Remix Studio's fans were, and still are, entirely unaware of what the creator behind the channel went on to do, and many current Pilot Red Sun listeners have no idea that Pokey Remix Studio existed in the first place. It's almost like a disconnected step, but it was clear even at this point that Michael Epler's passion for his medium is something that would continue to set him apart. After all, at this point, the story was only just beginning. In August of 2009, during the latter half of Pokey Remix Studio's uploads, a Fur Affinity account named Bittertooth was created, posting its first track, entitled Flying Snake, the day after creation. Bittertooth would go on to become the drum and bass alias of PRS, and while Pokey Remix Studio was winding down and for a good bit after, a massive quantity of tracks would be uploaded to the account, rivaling the amount created by Pokey Remix Studio over the previous two years. 
In stark contrast to the Pokemon theme remixes mentioned previously, the music of Bittertooth was harsh and experimental. Inspired by early 2000s artists and right at home among the DNB and Breakcore producers that had begun to carve out a niche on Fur Affinity at the time. The primary inspiration for the Bittertooth style, as the account would later describe, was a user named Mad Gamer on the hobby site Acid Planet, who would inspire Bittertooth's iconically complex and unconventionally timed breakbeats, a far cry from what he was producing just two years prior. While the tracks themselves were a rather abrupt jump from the stylings of Poké Remix Studio, the evolution was clear, as PRS was now choosing to pursue original electronic composition under the Bittertooth name. And just as with his previous project, PRS's music was received enthusiastically. He gained many new fans, many of whom had never even heard of his previous works, and continued to consistently upload drum and bass into the 2010s, winding down around 2013. It was by this point that he once again felt it was time to move on to a new project. PRS had come to feel like the tracks he released as Bittertooth were intentionally overly abrasive, and moreover he felt that he wasn't investing as much time and care as he'd like to into each individual track. And as such, he would transition to a new creative environment once again. He had seen success and praise with both Pokey Remix Studio and Bittertooth over the five years he'd been active, but interestingly enough, the peak of his popularity was yet to come. In June of 2010, a YouTube channel named Pilot Red Sun was created, although it would remain inactive for about two and a half years after this point. This was the next step in the PRS story, and this time he was going to do things a little differently. The channel uploaded its first video, entitled What's for Dinner, on December 21st of 2012. At 21 seconds long, the video details the trials and tribulations of an unnamed main character who asks an enigmatic chef for the night's menu, coming face to face with trays of slop and slime. The animation was nothing if not unique, and viewers' opinions of it were evenly split between disturbed and charmed. This would be the artistic avenue and creative style that Pilot Red Sun would pursue for the next few years. He would upload a number of animations in the same rough but distinctive style throughout 2013, releasing what is still his most infamous video, Garfield, in April of that year. The animation, largely a parody of Garfield comics, of which PRS was a fan, can be considered one of the early examples of internet Garfield parody, a genre that's almost hyper-saturated today. With these videos released throughout the early 2010s, Pilot Red Sun married his six plus years of experience in musical production with his growing interest in visual art and animation. His passion for digital art had been apparent since his time as Pokey Remix Studio, and after being transfixed by a 2010 music video by Finnish metal group FM2000, he had acquired Adobe Flash and set to work. He would continue to create videos into 2015, often incorporating his original compositions into the shorts. He cultivated an abstract style that seemed to viewers to somehow be primitive and high effort. Fundamentals like perspective and shading were largely ignored, seemingly on purpose, while inordinate amounts of detail and work were put into seemingly innocuous movements and elements, something Pilot Red Sun would later describe as, quote, brute forcing artistic merit. Viewers were often mesmerized by these unorthodox methods that really couldn't be found anywhere else on the site. Many, including myself, have found these animations and the tracks produced by PRS at the time of their creation to be strangely nostalgic, despite not corresponding to any real memories of the past. And speaking of which, it was during the Pilot Red Sun YouTube channel era that PRS would begin to make the music he's become most known for. PRS created a SoundCloud and a Bandcamp in 2014 and 2015, where he would begin to upload tracks unlike any he had composed before. Pilot Red Sun's new music was, in many ways, similar to his animations, unique and unorthodox in ways a listener wouldn't expect. His use of warm synths and unusual melodies created a sound that seemed like it came both from a forgotten past and a hazy present, and would often turn seemingly unmelodic strings of notes into something not just listenable, but highly enjoyable. All embellishment aside, it was really, really good, and the non-standard and even bizarre nature of tracks like Adding Elephants and Hollow Kingdom only added to their charm. 
Pilot Redson would continue to produce music under his current alias and upload animations to his YouTube channel, with his visual style becoming more detailed but just as abstract as it had always been. Many of his animations focused on simple topics like gambling in Casino Night or chip ads in Pringles advert, but through the videos these topics were deconstructed and reconstituted in a more absurdist way. One of Pilot Redson's largest endeavors during this period was the release of his first, and to date only, album, Achievement. The album, released 2016 on YouTube and Bandcamp, featured 12 new tracks in the style Pilot Red Sun had been cultivating over the last few years, and it would become one of his most successful musical projects thus far. Around 2018, Pilot Red Sun would even become a member of the artistic collaboration group Wayne Stop Enterprises, producing art and music for a number of videos and games. But as with each of his creative projects, the Pilot Red Sun YouTube channel and musical alias would begin to wind down after a few years. Into the late 2010s and early 2020s, Pilot Red Sun's animations would become more detailed and visually striking, but also fewer and farther between, some being uploaded close to a year apart. His SoundCloud would similarly begin to wind down its posting as we neared 2020. And it was around this time that the most recent chapter in PRS's story would begin. The YouTube channel Pilot Red Sky had existed since 2014, around the time Pilot Red Sun was uploading the first of his animations, but the channel wouldn't see any activity until 2018. In that year, around the time Pilot Red Sun had begun to slow production, the channel uploaded Podulaire, an audiovisual piece with a looping animation in PRS's classic style and an accompanying track of the same name, which would soon be posted on the Pilot Red Sky Bandcamp. Under this new name, PRS would once again focus almost entirely on the music production side of things, although he would still create art in the form of album covers and small animations for YouTube song uploads. During the time the Pilot Red Sky project has been running, PRS has continued to hone in on the sound he developed during the Pilot Red Sun era. And in my opinion, the tracks he's created in this most recent period are some of my absolute favorites. Haunting yet uplifting anthems like Simon Says, Yield, The Scuffler, and Polymer. And of course I can't discuss this without mentioning Fleece Snow KBS, which has for several years been in the running for my favorite electronic track of all time. Pilot Red Sky has continued to release a variety of new tracks, usually in the form of singles or EPs, for the past four years, and each of these is accompanied by an animated upload on his YouTube channel. And this is where our story ends, at least for now. Now, PRS hasn't entirely ceased activity on any of his former accounts. Pokey Remix Studio uploaded a remix of Ruby Sapphire Emerald's Route 113 soundtrack in 2020. Bittertooth uploaded a tribute piece titled Alter Ego later that year, and Pilot Red Sun uploaded the enigmatic Mr. Fujiwara's office that same year as well. While PRS remains most active under the Pilot Red Sky alias, uploading the Scuffler EP just four months ago, it seems that he's not entirely finished with any of his previous projects, and he very well may have a few more ideas to get out there. Now, this is the part of the video where I share my own story for a little bit. You see, I discovered PRS circa 2014, when he was operating under the Pilot Red Sun name, and likely because I was a middle schooler at the time, I just watched a few of the animations, was transfixed by them for a bit, and moved on. But as the years went by, I continued to return to the channel, and upon the release of Achievement, I discovered that the artist I had previously assumed was simply an animator was also deeply involved in music production. This was around the time I began to get into music as well, and over time I would take massive inspiration from almost everything Pilot Red Sun produced. To date, I'd say that PRS, in any of his incarnations, has been one of, if not the, biggest electronic musical inspirations I've ever had. And as you might expect, I'm not alone. PRS has been online in various forms for close to 15 years now, and in that time he's indirectly influenced an uncountable number of viewers and listeners. No matter what type of media he was producing, fans could always be certain that he'd do it by his own rules, creating something that truly could not be found anywhere else. And I personally hope that this never changes. Thanks for watching.
Hey everybody. So, last episode I talked about Pilot Red Sun, a musician and animator whose prolific career on the internet has inspired countless artists over the past 15 years. A good portion of PRS's fans have remarked that his music and visual style created, among other things, strange feelings of nostalgia for something that never really existed. Nostalgia is a funny thing. We can never really be sure what's going to bring it on, or why. For many people around my age, the strangest things invoke a longing for the past. Outdated media formats, cancelled TV programs, abandoned places of all kinds. In the vast and rapidly changing world in which we grew up, the things that remind us most strongly of our beginnings are often things that are no longer needed. The obsolete, the obscure, and the forgotten. And a franchise that has come to represent this more than most others is the defunct video rental chain, Blockbuster, once a multi-billion dollar global franchise, but now survived by a single location, once one of thousands. The story of Blockbuster Video is an unusual one, weaving in and out of corporate takeovers, shady dealings, and the decline of home media throughout the end of the 20th century. Take a seat, if you will, and listen to my tale. Our story begins, where else, but the 1973 oil crisis. You see, a few years after the turn of the 1970s, due to a number of factors I'm not even going to get into here, a critical shortage of petroleum took hold of the Western world. This led to drastically elevated fuel prices, an economic recession, and a transformation of energy production and storage in the United States. People, as you can expect, were not taking this very well. But for a select few, this crisis presented a unique opportunity. Oil was needed, more so now than in decades, and as such major American oil exporting regions were quick to take advantage. States like Alaska, which had seen the majority of its income sourced from natural resources since the Klondike Gold Rush, and Texas, which had seen a previous oil boom around the turn of the century, were able to profit tremendously off the nation's drastic need for natural gas. And in the state of Texas, a secondary and entirely unexpected effect of this economic crisis was soon to appear. In 1978, a Texas resident named David Cook began a business startup creatively titled Cook Data Services in the interest of supplying computer service and support to the Texas oil industry. Cook was technologically skilled and a gifted idea man. His goal was to profit off the oil boom by helping to streamline the industry with the computer systems that were growing more and more ubiquitous each year. Unfortunately, this would turn out to be a fruitless endeavor. By the time Cook Data Services went public in 1982, the energy crisis was subsiding, and the Texas oil frenzy had largely died down. Cook made a reasonable amount, but prospects were dim, and in 1985 he would sell his assets to begin searching for a new business opportunity. Now, the landscape of the early 1980s was a potentially lucrative one for business startups, particularly in the tech and media departments. It seemed every other day there was some brilliant new startup by young entrepreneurs making millions in a matter of weeks by taking advantage of rapidly advancing technology. Case in point, home video rentals. Companies were slowly coming to terms with the concept that customers might want to watch a movie more than once, and potentially own it for their own purposes. And the Video Home System Standard, or VHS, had just been adopted a few years earlier in 1976. The market was ready, but it hadn't yet seen large-scale industry. All of this was about to change. Cook later recalled it was his wife who advised him to enter the video rental business. Using capital from his sold tech company assets, Cook attempted to buy into a local Dallas video store franchise known as VideoWorks, but was dissatisfied with the lack of control VideoWorks gave him. In October of that year, David Cook decided to strike out on his own. The first blockbuster video store, named after an industry term for an explosively successful film, opened in Dallas on October 19th of 1985, with a number of very unique features to set it apart from the competition. Video stores at the time were known to be clunky, expensive, and difficult. Clerks had to fetch videotapes upon request, uh, said tapes could exceed $50 in value, and the buying process could take considerable time. 
With his background in computer systems, Cook knew he could streamline the process, and he set about designing a system in which tapes were cataloged in a database, displayed openly for customers to take to the counter, and then scanned with a then-advanced barcode system, and rented out to customers for a period of a few days, all of which was kept track of in the database. Of course, it also helped that Cook had an inventory of around 10,000 tapes, both VHS and Betamax, far more than any of the competition. And what resulted from this was a resounding success. The first night we were so mobbed we had to lock the doors to prevent more people from coming in, Cook would later recall, remarking on how Blockbuster's remarkably efficient system made the process of renting a movie something any customer could easily do. This early success led Cook to open a $6 million warehouse in Texas and open a number of franchise stores throughout the state. But Cook's status was still uncertain. He had never viewed himself as a businessman, and what public opinion there was of him tended to be neutral or negative, after a 1986 financial article pegged him as an outsider with little knowledge of the video industry. Change would have to take place if Blockbuster were to survive, and it would come in the form of a man named Wayne Huizenga. Huizenga was already a well-known businessman, the founder and owner of Waste Management Incorporated, a monolithic waste company that had come to almost single-handedly control the majority of garbage collection services in the United States through an aggressive series of buyouts across the country. Chances are, if you live in the US and you've seen a garbage truck, you've seen a waste management vehicle. Huizenga had initially been apprehensive about entering the video industry, but after seeing Blockbuster's success, he was convinced to buy a large portion of Blockbuster with several waste management associates in 1987. Unfortunately, this would spell the end of Cook's involvement. Due to some disagreements and Cook's general unwillingness to see the Blockbuster project through in the long term, Cook sold his share in the company and left with around $20 million in his pocket. And with his departure came a whole new era for the company. Huizenga kept a number of Cook's successful policies and methods, like his late hours and three-day rentals, but began to heavily push the limits of Blockbuster's expansion across the country. Using similar techniques to those they developed at Waste Management, and loosely following McDonald's franchiser Ray Kroc's model of expansion, Huizenga and Associates initiated a campaign of rapid and aggressive buyouts of numerous other video stores. Southern Video Partnership, Movies To Go, Video Library, and Major Video Incorporated were all acquired in the first year alone. Expansion became so explosive during this time that there existed a period in which a new blockbuster was opening every 24 hours across the country, and this only seemed to accelerate. By the late 1980s, Blockbuster had become number one in America, if only because there were no others strong enough to compete that hadn't been bought out. Now, with the US market in a stranglehold, Blockbuster turned its attention overseas. Blockbuster-owned locations under the Ritz name were opened in the UK by the end of 1990, along with a series of stores in Japan. The company rounded off the year by purchasing yet another rival, Errols, for upwards of $40 million. But this growth began to slow in the 1990s. Rapid technological advancement brought with it new ways to watch TV and movies, and Blockbuster wasn't exactly quick to adapt, foreshadowing a critical flaw that would come to plague the company in years to come. Poor customer turnouts in 1991 were waved away by Huizenga, who claimed the Gulf War had been keeping customers' interests focused on current events rather than video rentals. But even in this uncertain time, the company continued to expand. More and more international stores were opened with each passing day, and the company attempted some diversification, selling video games in a number of locations. By 1993, the company owned over 3,000 locations in 10 countries, and had just finalized deals to buy two music retailers, as well as the entire video catalogs of Republic Pictures and Spelling Entertainment. The company was selling videos, games, music, anything they could do to offset their decaying profits from video rentals. Unfortunately, this wasn't particularly effective, and the company began to encounter major trouble as the new millennium approached. In September of 1993, feeling threatened by video on demand and satellite TV, Huizenga began efforts to merge with media conglomerate Viacom, and while the merger did eventually go through, it was plagued by difficulty and saw both companies' stocks tumble in 1994. As the 90s ticked on, Huizenga finally surrendered his leadership position in the company, and Blockbuster continued to try anything they could to stay afloat. A number of unsuccessful CEOs with equally unsuccessful plans of action came and went. Blockbuster attempted to sell merchandise and PC repairs. The company was downsized, then moved. They briefly tested an arcade-slash-entertainment megaplex concept called Blockbuster Block Party in a number of cities. And while this is honestly a video topic in and of itself, it'll suffice to say the project was a failure. 
Things were looking grim for Blockbuster by 1996, and it seemed to many that the company would be just another relic of the 80s and 90s, outmoded by a changing world. But as you can probably guess, this wasn't quite the end. June 1997 saw the company take on former Taco Bell president and CEO John Antioco, under whom Blockbuster began a series of reforms to drag the company back from the gates of hell and into the limelight again. Antioco streamlined the company's business model, stripping away all the random stuff that had been implemented over the last five years and focusing almost entirely on video rentals. Revenue sharing agreements were signed with film studios, and international expansion began again in full force. Although the video store concept was on its way out as 2000 rolled around, Blockbuster seemed, once again, somehow, to be on its way in. In an uncharacteristically wise move, Antioco had store inventory focus on DVDs, which were rapidly replacing VHS as the preferred physical format, and made a number of other modernizing efforts in order to allow Blockbuster to compete with mail order and video on demand services that were rapidly taking advantage of a new ish technology called the internet. Amidst the chaos of the dot com bubble, Blockbuster turned down an offer to buy a small mail order video startup called Netflix for $50 million, with Antioco reportedly dismissing the offer under the pretense that the dot com hysteria was completely overblown. Blockbuster would, of course, come to regret this in years to come, but this isn't the time for fortune telling. In 2003, the company introduced subscription plans and online ordering programs to its customers. And soon after, in 2004, Blockbuster would hit its all-time peak, with almost 10,000 stores worldwide, making billions each year. But just as it was in the 90s, this success would begin to slip before company execs even had time to celebrate. The trouble began in 2005 with the company's ill-explained no late fees program, which in actuality just charged customers full price if they didn't return a video within 30 days. This led to lawsuits in a staggering 48 states, plus DC, and was a PR disaster for Blockbuster. Sensing that Antioco's decisions were growing ineffective, infamous corporate raider Carl Icahn, responsible for the hostile takeover of Transworld Airlines, began engaging in a campaign to get himself on the company's board and Antioco out of the company entirely. With its public image damaged and inner conflicts worsening, Blockbuster's days seemed once again to be numbered. An ill-advised 2007 internet promotion called Total Access lost the company hundreds of millions on the wager that it would draw in new business, and Antioco was finally ousted from his position, replaced by former 7-Eleven CEO James Keyes. I swear, the Venn diagram of different companies' CEOs is just like a circle. In 2008, the Great Recession forced the closure of hundreds of Blockbuster locations all across the country. Country, and in the aftermath, the number of stores rapidly dwindled. This coincided with the meteoric rise of internet video streaming sites, which were somewhat poetically spearheaded by Netflix. And on September 23rd of 2010, Blockbuster officially filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy after several years of decay. In April of 2011, Dish Network bought the company in an effort to revive it as Blockbuster's final CEO, Mike Kelly, took office the following month, but very little came of it. Throughout the 2010s, blockbusters continued to close, and by the middle of the decade its assets were being liquidated at a catastrophic pace. By 2018, only a handful of stores existed in the world, the last remnants of a dying species. Most of them, weirdly, were in Alaska, a place where the 1973 oil crisis had had somewhat different effects. But by 2021, even these would close, alongside the last overseas store in Australia, leaving behind one single location the last existing blockbuster in Bend, Oregon. The store pays a small licensing fee to Dish Network, still technically the owner of the now defunct company, but gets no actual assistance, merchandise, or promotional materials, and has to make everything essentially on their own. This single store is all that remains of a once international, multi-billion dollar company that revolutionized the video industry and left a lasting impression on several generations, including my own. Now, Weirdly enough, this final blockbuster is actually remarkably successful. It attracts a steady stream of visitors and customers, not just from the Oregon area, but all around the country and the world. Blockbuster merchandise, which was a resounding failure in the 1990s, proved to ironically be quite successful at this location as well. 
despite technically being a relic of an industry that doesn't really exist anymore. This final location stands strong, as a reminder of something that once was. You can still visit it today and pick up a movie to take home just like it's 2005, or 1995, or 1985 again. And I personally hope it stays this way for as long as possible. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, so last episode I talked about Blockbuster Video, a video rental chain that saved itself from near destruction in the late 90s, only to go bankrupt a decade later thanks to a changing landscape of new technologies. People like new things, we're almost always going to get rid of an old piece of technology in favor of a newer one that we view as being better in some way. Almost always. Sure, on an individual level, people like to look for the most advanced, cutting edge thing, but in the maelstrom created when technology meets economics, very often the champion technologies are actually those that are the most mass producible, reliable, versatile, and not most of all, cheap. Look at segmented displays. They've been in use since the early 70s, simply because they do the job without being overly complex or expensive. So on a semi-related note, I want to play you guys some sounds. Now, chances are, if you had a toy laser gun or something similar at any point when you were a kid, you probably recognize at least one of these sound effects. But it's not just the toys of the past 20 or so years that make these sounds. People born in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s all seem to have memories of one of these sounds, or at least one like it. I was born a few years after 2000 and I recognize it too. So why? Why does every toy laser gun make the same few sounds? Well, let's find out. I'm going to take a step back to sort of explain what I'm talking about. Basically, almost any toy gun you can find, made within the last 40 years or so, makes one of a very small selection of sounds, regardless of who manufactured the gun, how old it is, or what it looks like. Now personally, I think this is one of those weird little modern technological mysteries that people either never noticed or just didn't care about, like how every gas station cash register makes the sonic ring sound, or how every crappy toy phone in the 90s and 2000s played Butterfly by Smile. But I intend to get to the bottom of this one. Now, of all these toy gun sounds, one in particular is super memorable to me. Uh, this one, that's made up of eight different synthesized sounds, none of which actually really sound like an actual laser gun. Depending on the gun you got, they could play in order or randomly. There was even someone on my Discord who apparently owned a gun that would play all eight sounds after each other when you pulled the trigger once. I owned several extremely cheap plastic laser gun toys as a kid, and around half of them played this set of sounds. I sort of forgot about it as I got older, but when I rediscovered one of the guns while looking through some old toys, I found out that not only did I remember what each of the sounds was, I could even recall the exact order they played in. I'd do a recreation of them here, but I'm not really sure how well they'd come across in a video. Anyway, a year or two later I got some cheap little laser gun toys at a dollar store and discovered, to my shock, that they played the exact same sounds, despite being 10 years newer and from a totally different manufacturer and completely different in appearance. I put up a poll on my Discord and found out that almost two thirds of respondents also recalled owning a toy laser gun that made this sound as well. Weird, huh? This set of noises is one of a small handful of sound effects that seem to have totally dominated the toy laser gun industry since the 1980s. There's also this one, which sounds like the gates of hell being opened while a man shouts fire. And this one, which actually kind of sounds like a gun.
but this isn't all personal experience. If you go on YouTube right now and search up toy laser gun sound effect, you'll find that a solid 80% of every single gun you find will make one of these three sound sets, or one extremely similar. In particular, this video stood out to me, where a man demonstrates a toy laser from the 1980s that makes the exact same eight sounds as the one I picked up at the dollar store circa 2019. So what, is this some kind of global conspiracy where every toy laser manufacturer has conspired to make all their guns sound the same for some reason? To understand why this phenomenon exists, let's first talk about how a toy laser gun works. Now, similar to how some real-world weapons, like the Kalashnikov rifle, are designed to be simple, durable, and easy to produce so as to continue being viable for decades at a time, toy laser guns are usually made with the bare minimums in mind. If you do a teardown on one and remove its plastic casing, you'll find a simple circuit in which the gun's trigger engages a contact that allows power to flow through a few simple components. Your standard toy gun will have an LED light that flashes in a sequence and a sound circuit board that plays the gun's audio through a small speaker. A more deluxe model might also feature a small motor unit that makes the gun vibrate or spin something around. But let's take a closer look at that sound component. Now the sounds emitted by a toy gun speaker are determined by the sound effect board it's wired to. The board usually either plays a recorded sound or emits wave tones. An example of the recorded sound method is that sensory overload sound effect from earlier where the guy keeps screaming. You'll see this a lot in some newer but equally cheap laser pistols. But it's the wave tone generator method that I really want to look at. You see, wave tone generation is pretty old, relatively speaking. And from the sound of these eight sound bites I mentioned previously, the ones I was particularly familiar with, wave tones were used to create them. Now, a sound effect board that plays varying wave tones will most likely feature a small integrated circuit that generates these tones and sends them out to the speaker to play. And this integrated sound circuit is the exact chip we're gonna need to find if we wanna track down this sound. A little bit of preliminary searching turned up this. The HK628 Sound Effect Integrated Circuit, manufactured by Taiwanese company Hans Attack Electronics. The chip is described as being able to produce, quote, eight different sound effects, including, quote, rifle, alarm, bomb, and many more. An included sound recording proves that these are the exact sounds we're looking for. But uh, there seems to be a problem. According to Hans Attack's own website, quote, one of the fast growing and dynamic semiconductor company in Taiwan was established in May 1st of 1993. And if a number of forum posts and YouTube videos are to be believed, toys were being made to create these sounds several years before this. It seems more likely than not that this chip is actually just a more modern reproduction of an older sound chip, so we gotta look a little deeper. This brings us to another chip entirely, the HT28848 sound generator, manufactured by Holtec Semiconductor Incorporated, once again based in Taiwan. According to its datasheet, the HT2884 functions virtually identically to the HK628, although it's got different names for the sound effects. The datasheet for the 2884 is stamped with a date from July of 1997, but then again, all of Holtec's sound chips have datasheets also marked with July 1997, so it's possible they just revised and released their sound chip datasheets at the same time, and the chips themselves had been in production a lot longer. I say this because, unlike Hans Attack, Holtec was incorporated in 1983, a full 10 years earlier, which would put it squarely in the time frame these eight sounds seem to have began in. So is this the origin point? Are these eight classic laser gun sounds all because of the HT2884? Well, maybe not. You see, there's a bit of a wild card at work here. A company called Elenco Electronics has, for many years, manufactured a line of products under the name Snap Circuits. In essence, they're these little plastic circuit sets that kids can work with. Anyway, they make an integrated circuit component for Snap Circuits called Space War. As you can probably guess, it makes these same eight damn sounds we've been looking for. But the Space War circuit isn't some cheap plastic toy. It's Elenco's own proprietary circuit, so how does it work? Well, older versions of the circuit were made so you had to actually solder all the components together. And if we look at some listings for the kit on eBay, as well as its original datasheet, we can see that the sound chip used isn't the HT2884 or the HK628. In fact, it's not even a sound chip at all. 
The Space War sound generator uses a Texas Instruments NE556 dual precision timer, which isn't actually a wavetone generator on its own, but is being used as such by the Space War board. The Space War instruction manual credits its original creation to 1989, and the Texas Instruments datasheet for the 556 series has its original print date listed as 1978, far and away the earliest date we've seen so far. And just to add a little extra confusion into the mix, the NE-556 was also made in Taiwan. So what the hell is going on here? Why did Hans Attack make a sound chip identical to Holtex? Why did Alenco use a timer chip to make 8 laser sounds in 1989, when a dedicated sound chip for those sounds may have already existed? Which of these sound chip methods came first, if any? Unfortunately, I can't really answer many of these questions. All I really have to go on are the testimonials of random people on the internet and a few data sheets which don't really give me the info I'm looking for. If I had a couple old toys from the 80s and 90s, I might be able to look inside and figure out what circuits they use, but at the present moment I seem to be stumped. However, let me give my personal theory. The way I see it, in the late 1970s and early 80s, toys began to be made with lights and sounds using new circuit board technologies. At some unknown point, someone decided to use a timer chip, possibly the NE556, to set up a sequence of eight sounds a toy gun could make. Holtec Semiconductor, seeing an opportunity, decides to design and manufacture their own streamlined version of this system, the HT2884, a dedicated sound chip which not only generates these eight sounds, but also sequences LEDs for good measure. Somewhere in the 90s, Holtec stops manufacturing the 2884, or at least stops making it readily available, and fellow Taiwanese electronics manufacturer Hans Attack makes a chip that's a near replica, the HK628, to fill the gap. As for why these simple chips ended up in millions of weird little toys all over the world, well the answer to that is a lot simpler, and doesn't really need theorizing. It's cheap. For companies seeking to make the cheapest possible toys, buying a pre-made sound chip and simply plugging it into your board is a hell of a lot easier than designing your own sound circuits. And as such, the 2884 and the 628 found their way into the heart of the cheap plastic toy industry. I'm a little disappointed I wasn't able to discover more about these eight weird little sounds. The most obvious question seems to be, where did they come from in the first place? And I get the feeling that until I talk to someone directly involved or take a good look at some toys from the 80s that made use of these early circuits, I won't be able to know for sure. But suffice to say, if this sequence of crusty wave tones has been seared into your mind from a young age, you probably have one of these two or three integrated circuits to thank for it. Who would have thought that the desire to make as cheap of a toy as possible could have implanted a shared audio memory in the recollections of so many people? At the end of the day, there's really only one thing we can know for sure. If this all began in any one place, it was probably Taiwan. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, so last episode I talked about toy laser guns and the weird set of sounds they all seem to make. Now while toy laser guns have run pretty much rampant across the world in the past 40 or so years, real laser guns thankfully have yet to become fully realized as a practical concept. Some prototype devices do exist, but even if a functional individual scale laser weapon did exist, it would almost certainly be a close kept secret, highly impractical, overwhelmingly expensive, and quite possibly illegal in many ways. Speaking of which, have you guys ever heard of the CIA? Few government organizations around the world have managed to attain the notoriety that the Central Intelligence Agency has managed to acquire in the less than 100 years since its creation. And this isn't really a good thing. The CIA has infamously had its hands deep in just about every dirty affair you can possibly think of, to the point that the Wikipedia page for list of CIA controversies has been marked as, uh, quote, needing expansion for a good year and a half. Domestic wiretapping, catastrophic human rights violations, violent coups in foreign countries, and more have pretty much become standard fare for the agency over many decades. 
but I'm not here to talk about that. Have you ever wondered what you'd get if you crossed unbelievable amounts of government funding, an almost complete lack of moral and ethical guidelines, and a bunch of government workers with seemingly nothing better to do? Well, for this season finale KRB mini episode, why don't we answer that? This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower in... We begin in the aftermath of World War II, when it became clear to the U.S. government that a centralized hub for intelligence gathering and processing was needed in the event of future crises and catastrophes. The wartime Office of Strategic Services had been dissolved following the war's conclusion, and President Harry S. Truman was looking for an organization to replace it. While a number of governmental offices, including the FBI, were eager to assume the position, it was instead soon filled by an entirely new entity, officially designated September 18th of 1947 by the the signing of the National Security Act. The Central Intelligence Agency was founded with the purpose of collecting and analyzing intelligence to further national security and preempt threats. Or so they said. Like I've said before, the agency's gotten into some pretty bad shit, but along the way there's been a lot of activity that can be classified more accurately as bizarre, pointless, ridiculous, or sometimes just insane. Let's talk about a few. The Cold War was a great time to be an intelligence agency. No shortage of enemies, be they real, theoretical, or imaginary, and just enough fear to justify pretty much any level of action. As a result, a lot of this stuff on this list comes from this time period, including, of course, Operation Gold. One of the CIA and its allies' most high-priority objectives was to spy on the higher levels of Soviet government. Unfortunately, this proved quite difficult, although it wasn't for a lack of trying. Operation Gold began in late 1953, on the outskirts of Soviet-controlled East Berlin, when it was reported by the head of the German Federal Intelligence Service that an important telephone junction was buried just a few meters underground near the border of American West Berlin. The goal was to tap this line and potentially gain access to confidential communications coming in and out of Soviet Army headquarters in the heavily protected Russian-controlled zone. But how exactly does one get access to an underground telephone line in an area you're not legally allowed? to enter. Well, as the old saying goes, when in doubt, dig a hole. As part of a joint effort between the CIA and MI6, who bizarrely had some experience with this kind of thing, an intelligence gathering building disguised as a warehouse was constructed in early 1954 under the command of CIA operative William King Harvey. The plan was simple, make a warehouse with a comically deep basement, dig a shaft down to the level of the buried telephone wires, and then start digging towards them. By 1955, a massive, cast-iron-lined tunnel nearly a quarter of a mile long had been burrowed underneath one of the most heavily guarded areas of Berlin, and after accidentally hitting a septic tank and having to evacuate at one point, the telephone wires were reached and undercover British spymaster Peter Lunn completed the wiretapping process. The entire operation had cost 6.5 million, over 70 million adjusted for today's inflation, and it was paid for almost entirely by the CIA. But now that it was completed, it could potentially operate for years undetected, right? Well, uh, no. As it turned out, the Soviets had actually known about the little strip mining operation from the beginning. George Blake, a KGB mole in MI6, had alerted the Soviets to the plan before it even started. Not wanting to reveal Blake's status, the Soviets made the decision to allow the tunnel to operate for close to a year. And although no particularly high-level communications were intercepted, a massive amount of unencrypted telephone calls were accessed and recorded. The Soviets finally decided to blow the lid on the operation in April 1956, and Operation Gold was subsequently both condemned and praised for its ingenuity. Although it was known from the very beginning, and despite the fact that it was quite literally just a giant hole, the operation did yield a surprising amount of intel and was generally considered a success. I promise you this will not always be the case.
Moving a few years forward, we arrive at the space race, a period in time where the United States and the Soviet Union channeled their unhealthy rivalry toward each other by competing to develop spacefaring technology. As you may know, the USSR took an early lead with the launch of their Sputnik and Luna series of spacecraft, and at this point in the late 50s, the US was eager to get ahead in any way they could. And the CIA had a plan. They were going to heist this spacecraft. The Luna spacecrafts were of particular interest, being the first to leave geosynchronous orbit, and it just so happened that in 1959 the Soviets were putting on a worldwide exhibition showcasing their industrial achievements, including, coincidentally, what was suspected to be a partially functioning model of the Luna space vehicle. Several US analysts were able to determine rough information about the module, but this was not enough. And so the heist began. Investigating the Luna at an exhibition was ruled out as it was kept under heavy guard, so the plan was adjusted accordingly. Operatives would intercept the transport truck, swap out the driver, and escort the vehicle to an abandoned scrapyard. There, under the cover of night, they were able to remove the module from its crate and perform an almost complete disassembly of the entire craft, taking pictures and extensively documenting the Luna's construction. Once, when an electrical assembly with a seal had to be broken, a perfect replica of the assembly and seal were created by the local CIA station and put back into place. Before the night was over, the operatives completely reassembled the craft and its container, and by 7 a.m. the next morning, had it back on the truck and ready to be inspected and shipped out. While the module had been stripped of most components, the agency was able to gain a fair bit of information about its manufacture, and somehow this operation remained entirely unsuspected until information about it was declassified many years later. This remains, probably, one of the only known cases of a spacecraft section being heisted in the history of the world, and this is probably unlikely to change. Now, while we're still on the subject of aerospace, I want to touch on something that I just can't not talk about. It technically doesn't count since it was an Air Force operation and not a CIA one, but it's just too weird for me not to mention. In 1958, the US Air Force began a project in collaboration with Canadian aircraft manufacturer Avro. It was, at certain points, referred to as Project 1794, and its goal was the eventual production of the Avro VZ-9 Avro car, which, I kid you not, was a flying saucer. The VZ-9 was a perfect circle and ran by blasting air around itself in a ring, powered by a large turbine in the center. The original plan was for it to act as a high-performance, high-speed, and high-altitude air vehicle that could perform vertical takeoff and landing like a helicopter. Only a few working models were ever made, and while it was eventually abandoned in 1961 for being too impractical and not delivering on its promised specifications, it's still kind of bizarre that for those brief few years the Air Force had actual flying saucers in production even though they didn't really fly exactly like they were supposed to. Anyway, uh, back to the CIA. Overthrowing the Cuban government, and more explicitly uh, killing Fidel Castro, was in a way the CIA's holy grail for a good bit of time. It was sort of a wily e. Coyote roadrunner type of situation, with the agency executing a vast slew of increasingly bizarre schemes and plans and operations only to fail every single time. But of course this did not stop them from trying. Many of these were executed as part of Operation Mongoose, a Kennedy era series of terror attacks and plots to off Castro and generally spread disunity throughout Cuba. But many more were executed after this point as their own operations of sorts. Let's run through just a couple, shall we? Some of these never made it past the planning stage, while others were actually put into action, although obviously none were successful. The Chicago mob was contacted early in the 1960s, with the CIA offering upwards of $150,000 to poison Castro via a mob contact in Cuba. While mob boss Sam Giancana did accept the job, it ultimately turned out to be unsuccessful, as the first Cuban contact backed out and Castro decided not to eat at the restaurant where the pills would be served. Later on, the agency dabbled in less subtle approaches. Playing on Castro's fondness for scuba diving, a number of plans including a tuberculosis-infected diving suit and the colorful shell lined with explosives were promised. Although its authenticity isn't entirely confirmed, one of the most famous schemes was the concept of assassinating Castro via exploding cigars, which he famously loved to smoke. Normal cigars, that is, not exploding ones. One of Castro's lovers, Marita Lorenz, was at one point contacted and told to carry out the hit, but she reportedly didn't go through with it. Explosive kills were commonly attempted, as were standard strike teams and various other poisoned items, including a pen. Some other schemes were aimed not at killing Castro, but instead embarrassing or discrediting him. These included spraying Castro with an aerosolized psychedelic while he delivered a speech, and lining his shoes with thallium salts, which would theoretically cause his hair and beard to fall out. 
A retired Cuban counterintelligence officer named Fabian Escalante estimated the number of schemes or attempts at over 600, executed throughout numerous presidential terms up until the 1990s, and quite possibly the 2000s. But these wouldn't all be for naught. Castro would die of natural causes at age 90 in November 2016, proving that time may very well be the greatest assassination method of them all. Or not. That sounds kind of stupid, to be honest. Let's get into some weirder stuff. Now, how exactly does one spy on enemy communications in a public place while remaining entirely undetected? The uninformed observer may very well think this is impossible, but the wisest among you, of course, will almost certainly think surgically altered radio cats. Operation Acoustic Kitty was a $20 million 60s era spying project that involved just about what you'd think, performing a surgical procedure to implant a microphone and a radio transmitter inside an unsuspecting cat, and then letting said cat roam free in the vicinity of areas where supposedly covert conversations were taking place. The goal was for the cat to wander over, pick up information which could then be transmitted, and then wander off, leaving the victims of the spying completely unaware. The first real test of this concept supposedly occurred in the early 1960s, when one unfortunate feline subject was sent to spy on two men outside the Washington DC Soviet Embassy. Unfortunately, the cat was reportedly hit by a taxi almost immediately and wasn't able to complete the mission. And honestly, I feel really bad for it. Uh, the cat didn't ask to be made a cyborg and it sure as hell didn't ask to be made a spy, so it's pretty sad it ended up becoming a casualty of the Cold War. However, differing reports also state that the project was instead abandoned before a test was even made, and that the cat had its implants safely removed and that it went on to live a fulfilling life. This is the one I'm going to choose to believe for now. But regardless of which is actually true, the project was soon after abandoned for being too impractical and unpredictable, and was officially cancelled in 1967, thankfully saving future cats from being turned into microphones. But it doesn't just end with the cats. Psychic phenomenon were something the CIA had a vested interest in for decades. Many of you have no doubt heard of MKUltra, the two decade long project that aimed to develop brainwashing and interrogation techniques through extensive use of psychoactive drugs and psychological torture. But slightly less well known is the long running Stargate project. No, not that Stargate project, although that would be pretty sick. In the 1970s, the US government began to believe their Soviet opponents were experimenting with psychic warfare, and to be fair, they weren't entirely wrong. Their response, of course, was to establish psychic projects of their own. Throughout the decade, a number of projects including Scan8 and the Gondola Wish program were founded largely with the goal of seeking out and enhancing the abilities of those claiming to be capable of remote viewing, essentially perceiving locations and events at long distances through the mind. Based at Fort Meade in Maryland, the project went through a number of names throughout the 70s, 80s, and even 90s as it sought out individuals, both military and civilian, who were believed to be capable of seeing things not ordinarily able to be seen. At one point in the 80s, the program even claimed to have methods to train ordinary individuals in remote viewing techniques. However, this could not last. The project had never really been taken seriously, and a number of unfavorable evaluations throughout its existence led to it being continuously downsized, supported by a few individuals in high government positions who remained confident in its efficacy, until it was eventually shut down for good in 1995. Final documentation provided inconclusive results as to whether or not the program had actually produced meaningful data, but it's interesting nonetheless. Now, we'll end off with a short but particularly insane one, separate from the Cold War because I'm honestly getting really tired of talking about it. In 2005, during the initial height of George Bush's War on Terror, the CIA got in contact with toy maker Donald Levine, who had famously oversaw the design and production of Hasbro's legendary G.I. Joe line of toys. The CIA's mission for Levine was simple to create a lifelike doll of Al-Qaeda founder Osama bin Laden, which, when subjected to heat, would shed its face to reveal a red, demonic one underneath. Codenamed Devil Eyes, the eventual goal would be to disseminate these dolls throughout Afghanistan and Pakistan, where they would, according to the plan, frighten children and turn their opinions of their parents against Osama bin Laden. Shockingly, this is another one that never made it past the planning stage. But interestingly enough, three prototype models were indeed made by Levine 
line, with two having been sold for thousands at auctions and one suspected to be in CIA hands at this time. So uh, congrats to whoever managed to acquire these artifacts, and with this, we'll be done for now. Now, it might seem like projects and schemes of this kind are entirely a thing of the past, but you gotta remember, the only reason we know about them now is because, in many cases, it just took this long for them to become declassified. There could very well be just as many, if not more, horrific and insane programs at work as we speak, but we'll really have no way of knowing until they, too, become public knowledge. So until then, uh, stay safe out there, guys. Well, that was the last of them. As this particularly strange year comes to an end, a new one starts all over again. A new season of mini-episodes will begin production soon, so you can all look forward to that along with the customary Christmas episode. Thank you all sincerely for sticking around through a whole year of these little snapshots into the more unusual and unseen side of things. And a special thanks to the viewers who created the bumpers you've been seeing in between each episode. I'll link each of them below. I appreciate you all for continuing to watch my content, and I hope you'll continue to enjoy it long into the future. And although you've probably heard it a million times by now, I'll say it once more for good measure. Thanks for watching.